Hear the words of the Collect for the fourth Sunday in Advent. O Lord, rise up, we pray thee, thy power, and come among us, and with thy great might succor us, that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are sore let and hindered in running the race that is set before us, thy bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The colic for today is a prayer for God to help us in our daily lives. This assistance is necessary because we recognize that we are constantly impeded in our progress towards God by the sin that we so easily fall into. Yet, and because of this, we need His grace to be able to run the race that is set before us because we cannot run it on our own. Now, this colic leads us directly to the gospel lesson for today. But there's a few things that we have to understand about it. The first thing is, is that in the Gospel of John, whenever the name of John is mentioned, it is always, always talking about John the Baptist. It is never about the Apostle himself. There is never any confusion in his mind as to who he is talking about. The next thing we look at is to see that basically what John is addressing here is, if you will, a crisis in the ministry of John the Baptist. And this crisis revolves around the question of whether or not the Baptist is the Christ. Now this was a natural question to ask, considering that he was speaking with the voice of authority and power that Israel had not heard since the last prophet of the Old Testament had died over 500 years before. The people wondered. The priests wondered. The Levites wondered. But John knew better. He knew he was not the promised one. Therefore, they send Pharisees, Levites, priests, basically from the power structure of the time. And you could say that any time that the power of the time comes to talk to you, that they are not there to do you any favors. Therefore, the crisis. They send priests because basically the Baptist was from a priestly family and therefore deserve that respect. They send Levites because they were supposedly the learned ones. And of course, Pharisees, and all of them, because they are the strictest in the observance of all of the laws of the Old Testament. They ask him several times basically the same question. Who are you? Now, the first time he answers, I am not the Christ, because that was their real question. And then he says, when they ask him a second time, I am not. And the third time, he says, no. It's like, are you people not paying attention or what? You're not listening to what I'm telling you. So when they ask him the same question the fourth time, he just about explodes with their refusal to understand what he is telling them. And John 1.23 records this outburst. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Esaias. And of course, this is a direct reference to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, where that prophet wrote, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So they finally get this outburst from him, and they're, with that ringing in their ears, they decide that, well, this is not working the way we want it to. Let's change our tactic. We've got to ask him a different question. They ask him, why then are you baptizing? If you're not the Christ, if you're not that prophet, if you're not all of these other things, why are you baptizing the chosen people of Israel? <clears throat> Actually, their real question was much more forceful than this one. The real question was, if you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah sent back from heaven, 
Why are you calling the chosen people of God to repent from their sins as if they were some kind of sinner? That was the real question. But of course, they had forgotten to take into consideration some of what other prophets have said and recorded in the Old Testament, especially Ezekiel 36.25, where it says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse thee. Idols, idolatry. It's not just the worship of Baal, it's the worship of money, power, any of these other idols that men set up in their hearts. These were the things that John was talking about. And just as in the Baptist's earlier answers, the priests and Levites continue to ask him worldly questions, and he keeps giving them spiritual answers. So they're talking to each other, but they're not communicating. And this is especially true of the last answer that John gives, which is recorded in the Gospel, which is John 1, 26 and 27. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is whom coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. To put it in a different way, the Pharisees... And the Levites kept asking John about his person. But what John was answering was about his office. You see, John, in the strictest sense of the term, was not a prophet. See, a prophet tells you something that's going to happen in the future rather than what's happening right now. You see, John was a herald. He was the one that goes and proclaims what already is. You see, Jesus was already among his people. Now, he had not started his public ministry as yet, but he was there already. And John is saying, pay attention. He is coming. He is here. The people that came to John understood that. The Levites and the priests did not. And this is basically, if you will, the terms of looking at the prayer for the collect for today. You see, just as in the terms of the Baptist's ministry, he was proclaiming what was already there. And we must do the same. We have the presence of Christ within us. We have access to the Father through the Son with the presence of the Holy Ghost within us to have our prayers answered, to have strength given to us, to having the gifts of God given to us. So it's all there so that we may indeed run the race that is set before us. Once we do that, we can now come to the spiritual place that Paul is talking about in the epistle for today. And if Philippians 4.4 4 tells us this truth. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Once we have acquired, been given the joy of God, then we realize that there's not much else in life that we have to worry about. We do not need worldly trappings to define our spiritual existence. We do not all need all these things that the Pharisees and the scribes wanted and needed. We can achieve an inner peace and find that once we have that we are no longer concerned with what's going on in the world. People, yes. But we don't have to worry about forgiving someone that is probably going to go and harm us again. Because we're not keeping count. We don't have to keep count. We have gained so much that it doesn't matter what the world takes from us because it is nothing compared to what we have, to what we have been given, to what we have access to. 
It is as Philippians 4, 7 tells us. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This comes from God. It is a gift. Why don't we accept it? Why are we so concerned with all of the things of the world? I'm not saying that we have to, you know, become a monk and give it all up and, you know, all of that. I'm not saying any of that. If God gives it to us, fine. If He takes it away, fine. If the world takes it away, fine. Where is our treasure? Is it in Bank of America? Or is it in heaven? Where is it? What are you concerned about really? What am I concerned about really? These are all the questions that John is trying to bring to our attention. It's what the apostles are trying to bring to our attention. We have everything we need to live the life that Christ called us to live. Why don't we accept it? Why don't we live it? After all, as Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We were talking about the suffering of the persecuted church before. This is how they endure their suffering. How did Christ hang on the cross for three hours and total agony through the strength of God. We can too. We can persevere in this life through anything. Through health, through wealth, through poverty, through sickness, through death. And as long as we come to the presence of God, in the end, what did we lose? Nothing that really mattered. So it is my prayer that we will accept this grace from God, this peace that comes from God of having Christ in our hearts so that with joy we can go through this life and maybe, just maybe, we can share it with someone else and help them have that same joy, that same peace, that same certitude. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.